So imagine this kid in grade 9 in the 90s. He's new to a small town and feels like a stranger in an alien land. He's not big into comics, but he watches the movies when they're on TV. A large number of his classmates bully him relentlessly. He feels powerless. For some kids his age, comics are a fantasy escape. He was always inexplicably drawn to Superman. He feels like Clark Kent, but without the powerful alter ego. As Mark Wade describes Superman, he's not from around here. He doesn't belong here. He's an alien being, and he's probably more alone in this world than anyone else has ever been. Every day, similar thoughts run through this teenager's head. Although he relates with Superman's feelings of alienation, the comics just aren't on his radar. Until the day that DC Comics kills Superman. Death in superhero comics is kind of a running joke, as if heaven installed a revolving door for anyone wearing spandex. It's so common that there are in-jokes even within the comics themselves, like Superman praying for Martian Manhunter's resurrection in Final Crisis. In 1993, though, the death of a major character wasn't common. But it wasn't unheard of, either. DC's 1985 event, Crisis on Infinite Earths, wiped out multiple realities. In that story, The Flash and Supergirl sacrificed themselves to save the universe. Over in the X-Men comics, Jean Grey, whose codename Phoenix basically grants her a get-out-of-heaven-for-free card, had died and already returned. But Superman? Superman was the household name when it came to superheroes. Sure, he died before, but those were Silver Age stories. They were out of continuity. They didn't count. DC wouldn't kill him off for real. Would they? No one would argue that Superman was the first superhero as we know them today. He proved that comic books were a viable market. Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster's creation made everyone else try to mimic that success, which led to the creations of Captain Marvel, Batman, Wonder Woman, and really every superhero owes their thanks to Superman kicking it all off. According to Bradford Wright in his book Comic Book Nation, a spokesman for DC Comics claimed that Superman literally created the industry. Grant Morrison once said, From his creation, Superman was as easily recognizable as Mickey Mouse, Charlie Chaplin, or Santa Claus. In other words, Superman is a cultural icon bigger than most of his contemporaries. He was an American icon right alongside apple pie and baseball. By the 1990s, though, Superman wasn't cool anymore. He represented the status quo and traditional values. Batman long surpassed him in popularity, especially since the Tim Burton movie and the animated series. Darker, edgier, more violent heroes were even more popular than Batman. Fans swarmed around characters like Wolverine, Cable, and especially the recently launched Image Comics with their violent books like Spawn and Savage Dragon. This attitude is even reflected in the death of Superman through the character of Mitch. He's disrespectful to Superman, even when being saved by him, and prefers the cool, tough guy, Guy Gardner. And yet, when Gardner and his teammates fall, Mitch pleads for Superman's help, realizing that Superman is needed. With a world more interested in grittier heroes, was there room for a Boy Scout who wishes violence wasn't necessary? He says cheesy things like, As heroes, we choose to protect that good with our lives. Or at the first sign of trouble, he wonders if there's anything he can do to help. What good is a character like that in a growingly cynical world, even back in the 90s? And how would the creative teams handle it? Since 1991, the four Superman titles carried stories and continuity from one issue to the next within the same month, rather than having four distinctly individual titles. This led to heavy collaboration among the creative teams, including an annual Super Summit, to plot out the next year's stories. Doing this gave fans several memorable stories, like Panic in the Sky, Exile, Time and Time Again, and plenty of others. At one point, they were preparing for the next big event, Superman marrying Lois Lane, but ABC was about to launch a new show, Lois and Clark, The Adventures of Superman, and demanded DC Comics postpone the wedding so that they could do it first or at the same time. The creative team scrambled to figure out how to delay their plans. As he did during every Super Summit, writer Jerry Ordway famously shouted, Let's kill him! Except this time, the teams took the idea seriously and ran with it. Writer Mike Carlin once said, The world was taking Superman for granted. So we literally said, let's show what the world will be like without Superman. But how do you kill the Man of Steel? Oh yeah, Doomsday. ...with that meeting was, he wanted to do an entire issue that was nothing but Slugfest. A 22-page Slugfest with this great big Hulk-like bad guy. It was just power incarnate. And we had written on the wall, you know, Doomsday for Superman, as in... 
Look, let's be honest. As much as I like Doomsday, there's not much to him. Grant Morrison describes him as the unfortunate collision of Marvel's Hulk with a load of slate, dinosaur bones, and broken tusks. Chad Nevitt calls him a walking plot device. Other critics believe that Doomsday is poorly designed and came out of nowhere. And they're not wrong. Doomsday is impressive and terrifying, to be sure, but he's a one-trick pony. After the villain successfully kills the hero, what's left for them? Every time Doomsday has appeared since then, it's a case of diminishing returns. And I often wonder if demand for the character is largely just nostalgia-based. And yet, there's a few interesting things about him. For one, he's a physical equal to Superman. Few of Superman's rogues gallery can take him in a fair fight. Most of them are more formidable on an intellectual level, like Lex Luthor, Brainiac, Mixia Spitlick. Or they need an edge, like Metallo's Kryptonite Heart. Doomsday, on the other hand, is without intellect or an edge. He has seemingly no weaknesses, and appears to only get stronger as Superman fights him. He's death and bloodlust personified, nothing more. There is nothing in his mind but anger, no thought but destruction. There's no way to tell where he came from. Not that it matters. It's Doomsday's lack of origin in his first appearance that makes him more interesting. At this point, it doesn't matter if he's an alien or a lab experiment. He's here, he's unstoppable, deal with it. He's less a villain and more of a force of nature. Unlike other villains with schemes or motivations, Doomsday just destroys. Characters compare him with a hurricane. His first appearance resembles an earthquake. His path of destruction and the aftermath he leaves behind resembles scenes from a natural disaster. He doesn't even really care about Superman. Doomsday attacks whatever's in front of him, whether it's Superman, a semi-truck, a bird, a deer, or the Justice League. The only reason he fights Superman at all is because Superman keeps confronting him. When Superman is taken out of the picture, though, even briefly, Doomsday just moves on to his next target. The Justice League at the time, comprised of C-listers at best, are glorified punching bags to show Doomsday's deadliness. Doomsday's first engagement with the hero is showcased perfectly with quick moment-to-moment -moment panels, highlighting his speed and ferocity. However, the panel structure and the death of Superman's final four issues are the most interesting to me. Action, then Man of Steel, then Superman, then Adventures of Superman. And in each one of these titles, as the event of Superman's death grows closer, the number of panels in each comic book shrinks per page. We start with four panels per page. Then the next issue that comes out, there's three panels per page. Then we're down to two panels a page. The action in each issue is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. While Doomsday certainly became a notable and permanent fixture in the Superman mythology, the impact that the death of Superman had on the industry as a whole was even bigger, and possibly more destructive than Doomsday. Soon after the massive success of the death of Superman, headline-catching stunts filled the shelves. Hal Jordan went nuts, slaughtering the Green Lantern Corps, leaving Kyle Rayner in his place. Bane broke Batman's back, with Jean-Paul Valley taking up the mantle. Oliver Queen died and his son, Connor, took over as Green Arrow. And of course, most famously, Spider-Man's clone saga was Marvel wanting their own big event for their Hallmark character. It's been 25 years since the death of Superman, but its effect is still felt in the industry today. Character deaths and replacements have become so predictable that I tell people just to wait a year until the status quo reasserts itself. It's now expected a major death, or several, will occur during a major event, which means they're not really shocking at all anymore. Death and Resurrections were somewhat of a joke in the 90s, but they become completely meaningless at this point. At this point, they don't even create a ripple compared to the shockwaves of Superman's death. Bagged comics like Superman number 75 became the norm for special issues. The 90s were wrought with needless foil-enhanced covers and other gimmicks that speculators bought in large numbers for their potential future value. People who didn't even buy comics regularly would purchase multiple copies, which conflated sales figures and made companies push even more flash-in-the-pan gimmicks. As a result, the speculator market was actually a major contributing factor in the comic book market crash that closed hundreds of stores and drove fans away. But the death of Superman had one last major impact, and it takes us back to that kid in grade 9. The death of Superman is what got me hooked on comics for good. I had asked for Superman number 75 for my birthday, but when my parents couldn't find a copy, they got the collected edition instead. 25 years later, and I have three bookcases of trades and graphic novels. 
This very channel resulted from my love of comics, wanting to share that love with others, and getting more people reading comics. And it all started with this book. It made me appreciate Superman in ways that still inspire me today. He's the character I needed at the right time in my life. Superman, his stories, and what he represents to me helped me through my own never-ending battle with depression. It even inspired what some may say is my best piece of writing, my short story, The Never-Ending Battle. And it's kind of ironic that headline-grabbing events like this turn me away from most of today's superhero books. I barely read DC and Marvel these days because of it. But the creative teams have my eternal gratitude for the impact that the death of Superman had on my own life. Hi everyone, thanks for watching. I'm sorry this video took so long to come out, but I'm glad I finally finished it. For the next pick of choices, uh, we'll go with Andre the Giant by Box Brown, Norths by Alison McCreesh, and finally a documentary graphic novel by Alex Jensen, Jason Gilmore, and Nick Marinkovich. There'll be a link in the description for the Twitter poll, which you can find on my Twitter feed. For next time, which I won't make any promises on when because I'm working full time, I'm going to cover Warren Ellis and Stuart Eminem's Next Wave from Marvel Comics. So thanks very much, and uh, we'll see you next time.